he says uh, he's not holding back anymore on on keeping the businesses and things like that closed in the state of Florida. Of course, that probably won't happen here for uh, maybe how many days is it now? Forty? <laughs> is it forty days? Something forty plus days? Something like that? Then we'll start seeing things probably start opening up. That's my personal opinion. If you ask me, I think that's probably where a lot of us are though at that point, aren't we? We're just ready for things to get back to normal. You with me? <clears throat> but anyway, we're glad you're here today. Why don't we pray and ask the Lord to bless our time. Lord, we're so grateful for our church, our church family here. And God, we do pray that you'd help us uh, to hear from you. Lord, we long for revival. We desire revival for you to work in our lives. And so, God, I pray that you would, you would do a work, that you would revive us, that you'd stir our hearts, give us a burning desire for you. And so, God, I pray that you bless this service now. We need to hear from you. If there's somebody here today, God, that's not saved, I pray that today would be the day they come to know Christ as their Savior, and yet you'd bless our time now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much, choir. Let's stand and sing page 643, page 643. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul, page 643. Let's sing all the verses. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows is spelling with joy, I am telling. And all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. 
heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now, as we go into that second verse, how many of you, heaven came down and glory filled your soul? Sing it like that. Heaven came down and glory filled your soul on that second. Born of the Spirit with life from above, into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's blood, oh what a standing is mine. And the transaction at took when as a sinner I came, took of the offer of grace he did proffer, he saved me all praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my nights were turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Turn to your neighbors, shake their hand, give them the elbow, give them a wave, thank them for being here. On that last, now I have a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believed. Rich is eternal and blessings supernal, this precious hand I received. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away. And my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. All right, let's turn our hymnals over to page 638. He lifted me, page 638. He lifted me. In loving kindness, Jesus came, my soul in mercy to reclaim. And from the depths of sin and shame, through grace he lifted me. From sinking sand he lifted me, with tender hand he lifted me. From shades of night to plains of light, oh, praise his name, he lifted me on that second. He called me long before I heard, before my sinful heart was stirred. But when I took him at his word, forgiven me, he lifted me. Sinking sand, he lifted me with tender hand. He lifted me from shades of night to plains of light. Oh, praise his name, 
he lifted me on that third his brow was pierced with many a thorn his hands by cruel nails were torn when from my guilt and grief forlorn in love he lifted me from sinking sand he lifted me with tender hand he lifted me from shades of night to plains of light oh praise his name he lifted me on that last now on a higher plane I dwell and with my soul i know tis well yet how or why i cannot tell he should have lifted me from sinking sand he lifted me with tender hand he lifted me from shades of night to plains of light oh praise his name he lifted me great singing you may be seated all right ushers if you'd come let's receive our offering <coughs> this morning um before they receive the offering i just want to point out a couple of things one when you came in this morning you should have got a new bulletin looks like this uh you might say well i'm i know i've got your program now thinking you only get one of these once a month and you got your last week's um and you might think well i don't need one well you do it's september 27th because every week leading up to revival we're putting out uh some new things here to encourage us that um and as to reasons why revival is possible i believe revival is still possible today don't you and i believe it's possible on the inside here, you can read through it, but I'll just highlight some of the main things. I believe it's possible because God is all-powerful. Do you believe that? That God's all-powerful, and He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think. I also believe it's possible because men are lost and they need Christ. Aren't men out here lost and don't they need Christ? God's merciful. Isn't God merciful? <clears throat> the local church is still alive and well. I believe that. And I believe God uses the local church, and thank God for the local church. The Holy Spirit indwells every child of God. And so if the Holy Spirit would bring about revival in the past, He still lives within us, He can bring about revival today, and that God hears and answers our prayers. Also underneath of the heart-searching inventory, last week we dealt with priorities. This week we deal with moral purity. And so read through some of those things and ask yourself some of these questions. And if God speaks to you about some of those things, you need to ask the Lord to forgive you and, uh, and, and to help, you, help you with those. Now, uh, we just want to call your attention on the back. There's a couple of things. We have a Ladies' Craft Night that's coming up October the 2nd. That's this Friday night. It'll be down in our fellowship hall at 630. All you need to do as a lady is bring a glue gun and a snack to share. Uh, senior activity, we've got that coming up this Saturday, October the 3rd. Anyone 55 and older should plan to attend. A great time of fellowship starts at 11.30 and it'll be in the White Family Barn. And then the men's prayer breakfast coming up and you can read about some other things there also. Well, we're glad you're here today. Won't we pray for the offering and ask God to bless the offering? Brother England, we're glad you're here. Not out on the road today, huh? All right, why don't you lead us in prayer and ask God to bless the offering. sun so bright I see God's good hand in a baby's cry in a mother's lullaby I see God's good hand in a father's love in the stars above I see God's good hand in a lily white in a lion's might i see god's good hand in the tallest tree 
in the smallest seed. I see God's good hand in the desert sand, in the ocean grand. I see God's good hand in your good hand. There is provision for every need and care we have in your good hand there is protection a light for our every path in your good hand in your good hand in the cruel cross when all hope seemed lost I see God's good hand in the soldier's scorn as you hung forlorn. I see God's good hand in the garden that day as the stone rolled away. I see God's good hand in your good hand. There is provision. For every need and care we have in your good hand, there is protection, a light for our every path in your good hand, in your good hand, there is provision for every need and care I have in your good hand. There is protection, a light for my every path in your good hand. I'm in God's good hand. Amen. Well, that's a good song and an encouraging song, reminding us about the good hand of the Lord. I'm glad I'm there in God's hand. Amen. <laughs> I hope you're glad you're there as well. And the good hand of the Lord. Let's take our Bible and go to the book of Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. <clears throat> Last week we looked at 2 Chronicles 7.14 and we saw some of the ingredients that we need to have in our lives or what we need to do in order to have revival. And so today I want to keep that idea just there for us so we can see a real revival taking place here in Nehemiah chapter 9. <clears throat> and uh, you might not see it at first glance, but then I think once we explain it to you a little bit, you'll get the idea of it here in Nehemiah chapter 9. Look at verse 1, Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 1, we'll read down to verse 3. Now in the 20 and 4th day of this month, now we know what day that is, don't we? The 20 and 4th day, today for instance would be the 20 and what? Are you with me? The 20 and 7th day. Right? The 20 and 7th day. <clears throat> well, it was the 24th of the month is what it was. Uh, of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one-fourth part of the day. And another fourth part they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. And so in these verses, I think we can find some, th some things on how you and I can experience real revival. Won't we pray together and ask the Lord to help us? Lord, we need your help. We need your understanding, but God, we pray more than anything that you'll send revival. Send it to our hearts. Lord, we send, pray that you'll start a work in us <clears throat> and, uh, and that it will just ignite and burn in our hearts and that, God, you'd give us a heart for you. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd bless our time now together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There's a fellow by the name of Jeremy. He was hired by a church to be their visitation pastor <clears throat> back in uh, 1857, and so uh, that had to be probably somewhere where, uh, Carl, you were about, how old were you in 1857, Carl? About Carl's good to see you in church. Uh, you were just born, all right. I knew you were, knew you were younger back there in 1857. 
<clears throat> and, uh, and so back then, 1857, Jeremy was hired by a church in New York City to be the visitation pastor. And Jeremy was kind of disappointed of the turnout that came to the meeting. There were only six people that came to this meeting. But he encouraged himself in the Lord because of that Bible verse that says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, then he's in the midst. And so if there was two or three or six or 10 or 20 or 200, uh, the promise was that God was in the midst of them. So on that day, September 23rd, 1857, at lunchtime, he didn't begin to complain and grumble about the small number that turned out uh, as a response to his advertisement. He advertised for this event that was going to take place and uh, just had just a handful of people, of six people come out to this ad paid advertisement uh, of, of this meeting he was going to have. You say, what kind of meeting was it? We'll get there in a moment. He also rented a facility, rented a hall on Fulton Street there in New York and um, rented a facility. And so not only do we have him paying for the advertisement to, for this event uh, or, and also renting the facility of this hall to host this event where six people came and showed up. And he wasn't discouraged about that because Jesus was in the midst. You have to understand, back on September 23rd, 1857, America at that time needed prayer. The United States was spiritually, it was politically in, econ in an economic decline. Uh, many people were disillusioned a little bit about spiritual things because there were preachers <clears throat> that were predicting the end of the world in, in the 1840s. They were predicting the end of the world, and here it is, 1857, and the world didn't come to an end. So because of all those false predictions, they were a little disillusioned with spiritual things because of those preachers that had repeatedly predicted that the end of the world would happen in, 18, in the 1840s. They were also a lot of agitation. They were agitated over slavery. Uh, it was breeding a lot of un uh, political unrest. A civil war seemed to be near. And, uh, and just that year, financial panic had, had hit as well. Banks had failed and railroads had been, went bankrupt and factories had closed and unemployment had increased. <clears throat> and, uh, and church attendance was on the decline. This church that was in Manhattan there, they had hired Jeremy uh, because a lot of those, uh, a lot of the people that were in church stopped coming to church, and they were hoping that hiring a, a man to go out and visit people would kind of get people back in, but it didn't work. And so what Jeremy did is he rented this hall. He decided he'd rent a hall on Fulton Street and advertise prayer meetings. What was the meeting? It was prayer meetings. Prayer meetings is what he advertised. He enjoyed close fellowship with the Lord and thought others might too. The conditions in America got worse. And, uh, and, you know, sometimes when conditions get worse, people do turn to God in worse conditions. We've, we saw that back on September 11th. Remember when our country was under attack on September 11th of 2001? And those is Islamic terrorists flew planes into our buildings. You remember that? That's what they were, by the way. You know that, don't you? Okay. They were Islamic terrorists is what they were. And I don't think we ought to be afraid of saying that because that's what they were. Uh, they hated America, and they flew those planes, planes into our buildings. And when that took place, uh, we saw a turn towards God. I remember we were up on Long Island when that happened, and um, there was uh, people that were saying, God bless you, and people were praying, and they had banners over some of the overpasses would stand up there and said, God bless America. People turned to God in tragedy. And <clears throat> what you find October 10th happened, back in 1857 was the stock market crashed. And so when a tragedy took place like the stock market crashing, suddenly people were flocking to something. You know what they were flocking to? They were flocking to that prayer meeting. And they flocked to that prayer meeting. Within six months, that prayer meeting grew from six people to over 10,000 people were attending that prayer meeting at noon, at lunchtime. They were gathering together daily in prayer in New York City. <clears throat> Other cities caught on to this thing of uh, this prayer revival is what it was happening in our country. Other cities experienced a renewed interest in prayer as well. Chicago, the Metropolitan Theater, was filled every day with 2,000 people praying to God. <clears throat> Louisville, several thousands came out in meetings uh, every morning and prayed. 2,000 people assembled for daily prayer in Cleveland and St. Louis. Local churches were filled for months with people praying and asking God to 
a sin revival and to do a work in their life. Tents were put up for prayer all over in different cities. The YMCA, which was a, at that point a, uh, a newly formed organization, it played an important role in these prayer meetings as well. And uh, the media began to cover these prayer meetings because, I mean, it was just spreading in all the big cities. People were praying and <clears throat> depending on God, asking God for help. And so the media, George, uh, Gordon Bennett of the New York Herald, gave extensive coverage to this prayer revival. And then other media sources started picking up on it. And revival, the news of revival was traveling west by telegraph. And, and this was the first revival meeting that the media actually started promoting and got a hold of, and it started spreading about people praying. Now, there were several things about this revival that was taking place. Uh, the people that, that uh, were responsible for these prayer revivals, these prayer meetings, were not leaders. They were not church leaders. They were church laymen, lay people. Lay people were response. That means, you know, sometimes people think, well, the preacher ought to be the one praying. And I believe the preacher ought to pray. But lay people ought to pray as well. And so the lay people were the ones that were responsible. And, and something else that was the main focus of these meetings. It was not the preaching of the word of God that was the main focus. You know what the focus of the meetings were? It was prayer. Prayer and not preaching. Not saying that preaching isn't important. I believe preaching is important. But what sparked this revival, these revivals taking place, was prayer. And you'll find that with any revival, that prayer was an important component of that. That's what God tells us in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And so that small prayer meeting of six people there on Fulton Street in New York City <clears throat> uh, sparked a great revival that actually had an impact on different countries. I mean, it spread, revival spread. That revival spread to Ireland and Scotland and Wales and England and Europe and South Africa, India, Australia, and the Pacific Islands. All classes of people began, began uh, came interested in salvation. Backsliders were restored and returned. Conversions increased. Christian uh, families uh, started having daily devotions. Entire communities underwent noticeable change in the morals of the people. I mean, this is revival taking place. <clears throat> and uh, the preaching of the churches was focused more on intellect and lifeless. It was intellect and lifeless, the preaching was. Now it was concentrated with the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the cross. One preacher in Scotland had part of the Scotland revival taking place. He said this, it was a new spiritual life was imparted to the dead and new spiritual health was imparted to the living. And revival took place. And you know, my heart longs for revival here in America. I believe America needs revival today. I believe our churches need revival today. And, and you know, yes, we have a meeting coming up the uh, third week here of October, but revival can begin today. As we mentioned that last week, I kind of hammered that a little bit last week, that we need revival to begin now. If there's ever a need in America for anything, it's It's revival. There needs to be another great awakening to take place in revival. You look at our economy. Now, thank God our economy seems to be coming back, but it wasn't, it's not as good as what it was before all this took place. You look at how uh, the government, and the government has taken control of us in a lot of ways and has put fear. The media, instead of promoting revival, the media has just promoted fear in the lives of you and, of you and I. And there's a lot of that that's taking place. You look at all the unrest and the riots and the protesting that's going on uh, in our major cities. If anything, we need revival in our country. There needs to be a revival. If America was in a mess back in 1850 and the 1850s, I'd like to say America's in, in, in need. It is a mess in 2020. And we need to see God do something again. Whenever you find revival in history or in the Bible, you'll find that there are three important things that were important for that to happen. And you'll find that it was an unbearable perplexity amongst people. When you read revival taking place in the scriptures and in revival history, you know, there was an atmosphere of perplexity. There was a time of helplessness. There was a time of where things seemed so hopeless. And I see that happening in our country today. There's a helplessness that we have. There's a hopelessness that's happening in the hearts of people today. And, and what the, what, who we need to turn to in those situations is we need to turn to God, that God would help and God would heal. And we need to ask God to work on behalf of our nation. You'll also find not only this unbearable perplexity, but you'll find a unified people. 
When revival would take place in our Bible and in history, you'd find people being unified. In this case of this third great awakening that took place in America back in the 1850s, people were unified. They came together. Uh, they were praying together, thousands upon thousands. It all started with six, but that thing spread across the country. And there was undeniable prayer. You'd find unified people in an unbearable perplexity, but then there's undeniable prayer and revival always comes through prayer. Did you hear me? Revival always comes through prayer. Amen. Revival always comes through prayer. Real prayer. And it rarely comes through preaching. Now it can happen it's through preaching. God can use preaching. But there's an undercurrent, an underlying source a lot of times for God to bless a preaching service and it is prayer. God's people unified and praying. And I'd like to say, if we're going to see revival to take place, we've got to get back to praying. We have to be a unified people, falling on our faces before God and asking God to send revival to our country. I think if we're going to see revival take place, we need to understand that it's brought by laymen. I, I appreciate that about our men's prayer breakfast. I think it's a great Saturday, every, that second Saturday of the month where we get together. But I can tell you, I wasn't the one that came up with the prayer breakfast. I like it. I eat the scrapple. Amen. Amen. And all the good food that we have at that men's prayer breakfast. Man, it's good. And I like it, but I, I wasn't the one that it were originated. It was lay people. I said, let's have a prayer breakfast. Let's do something for the men. We'll have breakfast. We'll cook. The only thing I do at those things is I kind of coordinate the preacher who's going to be speaking every, every month. And uh, that's nice because that's one less thing I have to do to have, have to get involved in and have to feel responsible for, except for lining up the preacher. And, uh, and I appreciate that, but it's laymen. Uh, and, and for revival to take place, it's going to be laymen. You, you folks on the pew, they get a heart for God and get burdened to see change to take place in our country. And yes, the, the leaders, the church leaders need to be involved in that too, but it is, you're so important to seeing revival take place in our church. And so let me show you some things here in verses 1 through 3 that I think that we can see that just reinforce the fact of how we need revival and what will bring about revival in our country. I want you to see first off the setting and the conditions. You'd have to understand in verse 1, Now in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth and earth upon them. The feast of the tabernacles began on the 15th day of the seventh month, and it ended on the 22nd day of the seventh month. The people were allowed to disassemble on the 23rd day. They could go home and take care of personal business. They could go home and refresh themselves. But then they came back on that 24th day of the seventh month. So starting on the 15th, going to the 22nd, then they had a day where they could take care of personal matters, things they needed to take care of, but then they all came back. And what we find is there was a solemn assembly. The people had already gathered together for the Feast of the Tabernacles. They had declared a solemn assembly. You say, what do you mean by that? Take a look back at chapter 8, verse 18. Also day by day from the first day until the last day, he read in the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according unto the manner. And so they, have, they had that solemn assembly. They decided they were going to go and go take care of the personal matters that they had to do. And now in chapter 9, verse 1, we find that they have come back together for a sacred assembly. Now revival, get this now, revival involves people. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Revival involves people. And most revivals take place when God's people assemble together. Now, that's nothing profound, but that's the facts. Revival takes place when God's people assemble together. In the past, revivals have come when God's people would gather together to pray. They might gather in the fields. They might gather in the woods. They might gather on the mountains. They might gather uh, behind the or in the houses, in stores, in homes, and churches. But it was absolutely essential for God's people to gather together. That's what we find happening here in Nehemiah. 
you'll find God's people gathering together. This passage of Scripture is about their experiencing revival. You're going to see that in just a few moments. But they had to gather together. That thing carries over to the church over in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible tells us, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. There was 120 disciples that had gathered together. They were assembled together. And what happened? God's power came down, ignited that church, and as a result, 3,000 people trusted Christ as their Savior, were baptized, and joined the church. That's revival taking place right there. And, and what was a key factor in it? God's people assembling together. No wonder the author of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. I believe Jesus is coming back soon, don't you? And since he is coming back soon, it's important for you and I, as God's people, to assemble ourselves together even more. We need each other even more. Now, if I were the devil... This truth I'm sharing with you is not something you can't read for yourself. It's not something you can't pick up on. And you know the devil knows that as well. He knows that because of looking back at history. And he knows by reading in the Bible here and, and seeing it on the pages of the Word of God. He knows something happens when God's people assemble together. And if I were the devil, I would do all that I could in my power from, and stop and try to stop God's people from meeting together and assembling together. Now, I think you know where I'm going with that one, don't you? Because in states across our country, there are still churches that cannot assemble together. All because of a pandemic. And I'm not minimizing the pandemic. I'm not minimizing the fact that people aren't getting sick and people are, are, are dying. I am not minimizing that at all. And that's the last thing. But I will share this with you. Listen at these numbers. Uh, uh, July 25th, 7,960. Listen at these numbers now. July 25th, 7,960. August 1st, 7,953. August 8th, 7,437. August 15th, 6,729. August the 22nd, 5,678. August the 29th, 4,847. September the 5th, 3,641. September the 12th, 2,243. September the 19th, 606. Did you notice in nine weeks, this number I've told you started with 7,953 has dropped down to 606. You know what those numbers are? The number of deaths according to cdc.gov. The number of deaths that's taking place in America now all because of COVID. We've gone in the last nine weeks from 7,960 in the summertime down to 606. Now, you don't hear those numbers on the news, do you? You don't hear them, but you can go to cdc.gov. That's where I got the information from, and you can read it right there. I'll show you the picture. I can take you to the site if you don't believe me. But there have been 606 the week of September 19th that have died. Now, that's 600 people that have died. So that shows you some seriousness about it. But at the same time, all you have to do, and you have to realize this, that the survival rate, this is on the CDC's website as well. Go to CDC and look at the survival rates of this thing. Zero to 19. We've got several zero to 19-year-olds uh, in here. It's a 99.997% chance of survival. 99.997% chance. If you're in my age bracket, uh, 20 to 39 years old, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's Mrs. Hatfield's age bracket, right? 39, what do you call it? 39 and younger? With a little experience, that's right. I've heard her say that often. 20 to 39 years old has a, a, a greater survival rate than the 0 to 19. Its, its survival rate is this, whereas 0 to 19 was 99.997, 20 to 39-year-olds is 
That's, that's a big percentage, isn't it? 0.8. 40 to 59 years old is a 99.995 chance of survival. We're going to survive. 99.995. Over 60s, it's 97. So there is a concern for those that are over 60. We've got over 60-year-olds in here. But it's a 97%. Now, they also say, according to CDC, the great majority will not be infected at all. So the question is, if in the United States 600 people, 600 people have died, whereas nine weeks ago we had 7,000, why aren't we opening up? Why aren't the schools opening up? I mean, 0 to 19, 99.997 survival rate. Do you realize this? That you take a chance. Now, this is, you're, you have a greater chance of dying of heart disease. You have a greater chance of dying of cancer. You have a greater chance of dying from the flu. You have a greater chance of dying from suicide. You have a great a greater chance of dying from an op opiate overdose. You have a greater chance of dying from a motor vehicle crash. You have a greater chance of dying from a fall. You have a greater chance of dying from a gun assault. You have a greater chance of dying walking across the street. Okay? Pedestrian incident. You have a greater chance of dying by riding your motorcycle. Anybody in here have a motorcycle? Okay. You have a greater chance of dying riding your motorcycle. You have a greater chance of dying from drowning. And yet, doesn't stop us from getting in the water. Doesn't stop us from riding our motorcycles. Doesn't stop us from walking across the street. Doesn't stop us from getting up on a ladder. Doesn't stop us from driving in our vehicles. Am I right? I mean, there's a greater chance of us dying, according to InjuryFacts.com. You know the injury facts and the percentage of you dying. There's a greater chance. And yet we have shut down everything. And, and what bothers me is the fact that the church is being shut down still. And if I were the devil and trying to stop a revival from taking place in our country, he knows he has to stop God's people from assembling together. Amen. And he's going to try to do everything he can to do it. And we're told not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. And so that's why we, you know, that's why we, when we had the lockdown, we chose the lockdown for the safety because we didn't know a lot of information back in March. We chose the lockdown for the safety of people. And I'll tell you this. You, you see me, I didn't shake hands today. Why is that? Because I realize there's 60-plus holders here, and I was in a high-risk area. Well, it's not high-risk anymore. I noticed Texas is a high-risk, and a lot of states in the Midwest now are high-risk. But Florida is not in that high-risk category anymore. But people think it is, so I just decided I wasn't going to get out there and shake hands with everybody today just for the safety, your safety, because I'm being, so trying to be sensitive to some of you. Because I don't want to spread anything if, if I caught something down there. But the fact is, is that more than likely we will, we will make it through it. And we don't shut down for those other things. And we definitely don't shut down churches. So when it all happened, what did we do? We met out in the parking lot. We are going to keep church going on. I preached in the rain with an umbrella overhead to keep church going on. Right? I preached with smoke blowing in my face from the neighbor. Thank you, neighbor, for doing that. Boy, I'm glad we're inside right now. The neighbor burning fire over next door. <clears throat> you know, it seemed like he did it every Sunday, a couple Sundays in a row. He just started up his fire out there burning the brush. Why couldn't you do that on Monday or some other time, you know? But we, we just kept going. And, and we met outside. We thought about how to do it and still how, how to do it. And so... We've got to assemble together. If you're going to see revival take place, it's they were assembled with fasting. Verse 1. Let me show you this. The sackcloth and attire that they had. 
All right. <clears throat> so verse, uh, verse 1 also tells us they were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth. And some people say, what in the world is that? Well, I can tell you it's not as soft as your cotton that you're wearing. In fact, it's made of very coarse and uncomfortable goat's hair. We saw an old billy goat while we were down in Florida because we decided we were going to do an activity where we would get it. They had this, uh, this farm had, I forget, 1,500 acres of farmland or something like that, maybe 2,500 acres or something like that. I forget. It was a lot of acres of farmland. All or orange trees, and we were in the orange groves, and they had these buses that they confer- converted into monster trucks. So a big monster truck bus. Big tires, not like the mini bus up here by the metal shop. That's the mini one, all right? These are full-size buses. And so they, they took us out into the, uh, into the orange groves and the, riding through all the farmland that they had back there. <clears throat> and we got to see the, uh, we got to see some of their longhorn cattle that they had. And we saw these African cows that they had with these great big horns. We got to see an alligator. You go to Florida, you want to see an alligator, right? We saw the alligator out there. We rode through four feet of water. Uh, coming up almost to the tops of the tires, the monster truck tires. We're just riding through all this water uh, with these monster trucks. And uh, we saw water buffalo, and we saw zebras. In fact, the zebras were named, one of them was named uh, Barcode, and the other one was named Scanner. Isn't that a good name for zebras? (laughs) Barcode and Scanner, right? And so they named it that. But when we were, the cows and the zebras, they all loved oranges. And so the lady that was taking us on the bus, she's driving the bus, she uh, gave us, has, gave us, had a big basket of oranges there, and she said, here, feed them to the cows, and so the cows would come right up, right, hanging over the bus, and, uh, and they'd eat the oranges out of your hand, and you'd throw the oranges to the zebras, and she said, oh, here he comes, the billy goat. You know what his name was? Real original, Billy. <laughs> billy the goat. He had a long beard, he had long hair, white hair coming off of him. They had to put him back by the zebras because he couldn't be up by the petting zoo where the kids would be because he was a mean billy goat. And they said, they said, you watch him when he comes over here by these zebras, these zebras will knock, him, knock some sense into him if he gets too close to them. And he did, he watched, he came up, get that orange, and he was watching those zebras to see how close he was getting to the zebras. But you know, if you ever felt a hair, the goat hair, it's not the softest like the, like the sheep. It's very coarse. And so they'd put these garments on, these garments of sackcloth of goat's hair. It showed how perplexed they were over their sinful state. The people had previously assembled together to hear the word of God. And upon hearing the word of God read to them, what they began to do is they began to realize how sinful they were. And so now they're at a time of fasting, they're at a time of mourning, they're at a time of reflecting, they're at a time where they had spent time in the Word of God, and it showed them how sinful they really were. They also are fasting here. And we we know, according to some early church documents, uh, written about the first and second century, now, they do not have the authority of the Bible. But we know that some of the churches, early churches back then, would dedicate two days a week. Now, you don't find this much anymore. But two days a week were dedicated in those early churches about the first century and the second century to fasting. And those two days would have been Wednesday and Friday. Wednesday they would fast and Friday they would fast. The church, that was just part of being a disciple. The fast on Wednesday and Friday. I could see me getting up and saying, hey, if you want to be a member of Bayview Baptist, you've got to fast every Wednesday and every Friday. We wouldn't have very many members. Uh, The uh, preacher, John Wesley, you've heard him before, haven't you? John, who started the Methodist churches. We have a lot of Methodist churches in our area. John Wesley, uh, he believed those teachings so much, he did that himself. Every Wednesday and every Friday he would fast. Now, we don't find that in the Bible, but it was just practice of that early church, would they say. And in fact, he believed in it so strong that he refused to ordain any preacher that would not fast on Wednesday or Friday. He wouldn't ordain a preacher if they didn't fast. Fasting. Jonathan Edwards, man used by God to bring about the first great awakening. I've read that he preached with a weak and very squeaky, monotone voice. 
He held his tiny manuscript up so close to his face that people couldn't even see his expression. Can you imagine if I was preaching and I had a tiny manuscript and I have it hold, held up to my face like this where you couldn't see the expression? A squeaky, high, squeaky, monotone voice is what he had. When he preached that message, sinners in the hands of an angry God in his weak, squeaky, monotone voice, people had to strain to hear him preach. But it is said that he preached with so much power, all right, that, and conviction that some of the strong men were hanging on to the pillars there in the church, feeling like they were about to fall into hell. So much conviction from that man's voice and his squeaky, monotone voice. Boy, he didn't have the energy and the eloquence or the theatrics of modern-day evangelists. He just got up and preached the Word of God. But what people don't know is three days before, a lot of people don't realize this, they hear about that message, sinners in the hands of an angry God. <clears throat> three days before the preacher got up and preached that message, he decided that he wasn't going to eat for three days and he wasn't going to sleep for three days. He was just going to pray. He was claiming New England for Christ. And people that would walk by his room could hear that squeaky voice crying out to God three days prior to that, before he preached that message, crying out to God, asking God, God, give me New England. Give me New England. And after three days of fasting and three days of prayer, no sleep, Jonathan Edwards, he was uh, weak, he barely could get up uh, behind the pulpit. He had to lean and, bur and prop himself up on the pulpit. Can you imagine going to church with that? The preacher being so weak. But they say that before the first word came out of his mouth, there was such conviction in that place. Because he had been with God. And he had spent that time with God. And you know, I wonder what God would do if some of us would just get serious about spending time with God and getting back to praying and getting back to fasting. Let me show you something else that happens here. You find him separating himself and confessing, and i got to move quickly. But look at, <coughs> look at chapter 9, verse 2. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. <clears throat> You'll find that the Jews assembled for this sacred time of hearing the word of God. There was a time of fasting, and there was a time of mourning, and, and uh, they wanted to see God do something in a great way. And so what did they do? The Bible tells us that it's not the seed of Abraham, it's the seed of Israel. Though they were descendants of Abraham, they're not called the seed of Abraham, it's the seed of Israel, because they were a full-fledged nation called Jews or the nation of Israel. And upon hearing the word of God, upon reflecting, uh, uh, after hearing and reflecting on the word of God, God began to speak to them. Probably Ezra dealt with the sin of their mixed marriages. They had mixed marriages. You say, what do you mean by mixed marriages? God's people marrying pagans. Okay? <clears throat> and they had married the pagans, and those pagan wives were it causing them to be introduced and to compromise uh, their beliefs in God. And so Ezra had preached on that earlier, <clears throat> and these people were, had broken off that, but during the process of time, they were reuniting with those previous wives and being in those mixed marriages again. And so they are hearing the word of God, they are confessing their sin, and it didn't just stop with their sin. You read there in verse 3, and they're crying out for the iniquities of their fathers, the past generations, and how they realized that the past, the previous generations, had, had done things and sinned against God, and they are confessing their sin. They are separating themselves. I'd like to say this, you know, when God speaks to your heart about something that's going on in your life that you know that's not right, not only do you need to confess it, but you ought to forsake it. Separate yourself. Confessing and forsaking our sins. And that's what you find going on here. They're confessing and forsaking it. Confession and separations are keys. <clears throat> 
to a real heaven-sent revival. A man told his pastor he had done a terrible thing one time, and he could find no rest for his conscience. And the pastor asked him, he said, have you confessed it to the Lord? And the man replied, he said, Pastor, I've confessed that sin a thousand times. And the wise pastor said, that's 999 times too many. You should confess it once and praise God a thousand times for his forgiveness. And that's what we need to do. Confess it once and praise God for his forgiveness. John, 1 John 1, 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That verse we read last week, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will hear their land. That verse was seen in full display back in uh, February 26, 1995 at the Jersey Village Baptist Church down in Houston, Texas. You say, what happened down there? Well, the congregation began their evening service at normal time. We start ours at 6. They started at 6.30. Expecting the routine of the regular service, it'll last about an hour. But during the invitation, something happened. During the invitation, a young lady, a teenage girl, got up from her pew, came forward during the invitation, walked the aisle, began to confess her sin, sought the Lord's forgiveness, and then sought encouragement from the church. A young lady got out of the aisle, walked the aisle, confessed her sins, got right with God, got right with God's people, and then tried to find encouragement from God's people. And after her response, other members started coming forward, confessing their sins. Uh, and around 9 p.m., uh, this thing was still going on, probably been over normally about 7.30 but an hour and a half later, that thing was still going on. Invitation, altar call was still happening all that time. People coming forward on their knees confessing their sins before God. Some people got the idea that people down in the nursery, some of those nursery workers needed to be relieved, and so they would relieve the nursery workers. Well, that was nice of them to do that, amen? And they'd go down to the nursery, and a couple came forward, came to the aisle. She was down in the nursery, and her and her husband came forward and knelt at the altar and began to pray for their son. Their son had run away four months before because he wanted his freedom to live his life as he desired. God, help us when we come to a point where we feel like we want to live our life as we desire. We ought to live our lives as God desires. Amen? What does God desire of your life, young person? So he's at this party about an hour and a half, 90 minutes away. And while his parents are down at the altar praying for him, that he'd get his, give his life, his heart and back to Christ and get right with God, he begins to feel conviction and decides that he's going to go home. He drives that 90 minutes. And after 90 minutes, he gets home and the house is dark. And he thinks, why in the world will the house be dark? My parents go to church Sunday night. But why would they still be at church this late? He drives to the church. Notices the lights are on at church still. Walks up to the door and a deacon notices who he is. Takes him down to the front where his parents are praying. And the son tapped him on the shoulder. And in a tearful embrace, he told his parents he had decided that he was going to come home. And fully surrender his life to Christ. You talk about revival taking place, that's revival. Now let me ask you this, what would have happened? What would have happened if that teenage girl didn't leave her seat and come forward and confess her sin? They would have probably had an end of the service at 7.30 and that would have been it. But thank God for the young person who decided she was going to get right with God, confess their sin, and get right. Let me show you the last one and I'll be done. <clears throat> There's the scriptures and the celebration. This is going to lead us to what happened. Look at this dedication now. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one-fourth part of the day. 
And another fourth part, they confessed. And they and worshiped the Lord their God. Now notice this, it's amazing. Because see, here's the reverence that they had for the word of God. They stood up <clears throat> and uh, revival will take place when we consider our sin. We see how sinful we are. We assemble together. We're praying. We're fasting. All those things take place. And, uh, and so they've assembled. The Jewish day was about 12 hours. It was broken up into three-hour increments, which means that they probably began this, verse 3, at 6 a.m., and it's 9 a.m. From 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., what are they doing? They're standing, and they're continually reading the Word of God. Now, can you imagine if I said we're going to have church at 6 a.m.? We'd have a fourth of the crowd here. But I said, we're going to go all the way to 9 a.m., three hours. It's hard enough to get people to stay a little over an hour, let alone three hours. And then if I told you not only that, but you had to stand the whole time. Instead of sitting on your nice, comfortable, padded pew, people wouldn't come. But these people did. They assembled. See the assembling? That's important. All right? And they stand they're standing, they're intently listening. Then, verse 3, they're reading in the book of the law, a fourth part of the day. And another fourth part, what are they doing? They're confessing. So they're reading. That reading of the Bible leads to what? Confessing. And then what we find they're doing, lastly, is they're adorning. <clears throat> they are worshiping the Lord their God. So I believe this, true revival will come. When we assemble together, where we have the word of God read, whether personally or as a congregation, we hear it. It brings about conviction to heart. We confess. We get right with God. And what happens? It puts us in that right place where we can properly worship the Lord their God. So here's what happens. In a moment, we're going to give an invitation. You've heard the word of God preached. You've heard it read. Maybe God's dealing with you about some things in your own personal life that you know you need to take care of. Come during an invitation. Confess it to God. Because that will put you in a place. Confess it. Forsake it. That will put you in a place where you can properly worship God. You can have revival. That's the starting place. The word of God preached. The word of God read, bringing conviction to the heart, and God's people getting right. Amen? Amen? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, we need revival. We need you so much to send about a revival in our lives. And so, God, I pray that you would help us. Help us to see it in the Bible. Help us to understand it in history, that it's going to come as a result of praying. And so, God, give us some people that will begin to pray right now for revival to take place. God, help us through the word of God that you would shed light on our sin and you'd help us to confess and forsake our sin and to get right with you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to turn to you, to seek your face, to turn from our wicked ways in order to experience revival. God, please work in hearts this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. With our head bowed and eyes are closed, no one looking around. I wonder if there might be some, or how many of you would say this? Pastor, I know that I'm saved. I know for sure when I die, I'm going to heaven. There's been a time in my life when I asked Jesus to be my Savior. And I know for sure when I die, heaven's my home. If that's your testimony, raise your hand real high. All right, God bless you. Many hands raised. Thank you for your honesty. I appreciate it. I wonder how many of you would say, you just raised your hand, you're God's people. How many of you would say, Pastor, I'm going to begin praying for revival. I'm going to begin to pray that God will send revival. Not only in my heart, but also in our church. That God will spread it through our community. That God will do something in a great and mighty way. Pastor, I'm going to begin praying for revival. I realize my country, our country needs revival. And I'm going to begin praying that God will send revival. How many of you would raise your hand and say, Pastor, I'm with you. I'm going to begin praying that God will send revival. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to take this seriously. God, thank you so much for the hands. I pray, God, I pray if each and every one of us with our hands lifted, or who had our hands lifted, would begin to honestly and earnestly pray to you.
for revival, that you would do something great. God, I pray that you'd help all of us to get right. You'd help all of us to confess our sins. You'd help all of us to seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. God, we want you to heal our land. We know the hope is not coming from Washington, D.C. But God, we know our hope is coming from you. And so, Lord, we pray for revival. We're looking forward to seeing how you're going to work. Please send revival in Jesus' name. Now, with our head bowed and eyes are closed, no one looking around, I wonder if there might be somebody here that would say, Pastor, I don't know that I'm saved. I don't know for sure when I die I'm going to heaven. Would you pray for me, Pastor? I don't know for sure when I die I'm going to heaven. Would you pray for me? I'd like to pray for you. I won't embarrass you. I promise you that. I'll pray for you. Is there anybody like that at all? Say, Pastor, pray for me. I don't know for sure when I die I'm going to heaven. Would you pray for me? Would you just lift up your hand so I can see it? Anybody like that at all? Lord, please bless the invitation now. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's all stand with our head bowed and eyes are closed.